Hey everyone, Jay here. We've heard you. Money is tight, time is tight, we're all feeling the squeeze. That's why we've got a lot of new offerings beginning now and in the next few months to fit any budget and schedule. But you have to go to my website or be on my email list to hear about them because we don't use social media and we want to keep the podcast as free from promotions as possible. It's all at jbrownyoga.com. That's jbrownyoga.com. All right, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown, and you are whoever you are listening. Thank you for that, for being you and choosing to listen. Welcome if you're new, and everybody else, what's up? How are we doing? If you were here last week, then you know I was away from home. I was at my in-law's place in Virginia for our annual late summer visit. And then you also know that I broke from my usual protocol and spent some solo time pontificating on the economics of yoga centers. I was a little bit apprehensive about whether or not that was a good idea, but it seems like I definitely hit a nerve because a slew of emails came in, and many of those emails were from long-time listeners. And when a long-time listener, someone who's been here since the beginning, says, I have to take some time out of my day to write to Jay about the episode, it means a lot. It seems like many of us have been thinking or feeling about these things in a similar way. And there does seem to be some kind of shifting happening, some kind of tectonic shifting happening. Very interesting. Thank you to everybody who did take a moment to reach out. Even those of you who didn't, if you just listened and thought about it, thanks to you as well. And it ties in directly to my talk today with Ryan Cunningham. You see, it was a few days before I recorded last week's rant on yoga centers. <laughs> Several days before I did that, I was at my computer and I was writing about that and I was thinking about it. And I received several emails Within a, a couple of days, actually it was a course of several days, I got emails from local yoga centers in Boston. I'm on a bunch of email lists. Over the years, I have a practice of whenever I come across a yoga center that seems like they're doing really interesting stuff or certain teachers over the years, I just put myself on their email list and I find that's the best way to kind of keep tabs on what's going on out there. Because whenever somebody has like a new thing that they're doing or a big change, they send out an email to their list. I think most of the time that still happens these days. So I got these emails from two different email lists about yoga centers in Boston and yoga spaces being re-inhabited and people moving from one old yoga space to another. And I was like, wow, there must be something going on here. There, there feels like there's some kind of shift happening. And the person I know who knows about the local Boston yoga scene is Ryan. And I, I don't need to say too much here. We go over the history of Ryan's appearances on the show. The first one was back in 2015, and we've been having a conversation about owning, operating, and managing yoga centers and different models, different business models for how to do that. And the conversation we've been having since 2015 has evolved with the way things have shifted and changes in the market and in our culture. So... Getting a chance to touch base with Ryan on this was exactly what I needed. And it really fleshed it out even more than I was able to by myself last week. 
And it was so perfect a follow-up to my talk last week. I felt that it had to happen right here. We recorded this like a couple of days ago. I think it was maybe 10 hours after last week's episode published, Ryan and I had this conversation. And fortunately, Ryan had had a chance to listen to it, so it was perfect. And I just felt that this was such a perfect follow-up. It had to come this week. So I know I mentioned I've got another like deep learning yoga philosophy episode. We're going to listen to it next week. This week, we had to listen to this conversation I had with Ryan. It was just too perfect. And for those of you last week who resonated with what I was talking about, I think that you're going to really appreciate this as well. Very glad to have reconnected with Ryan, and it is a deep pleasure for me to share it with you today. Other than that, I don't think there's anything else. If you are not already signed up for my free email list, I encourage you to do that. There's lots of ways that we might connect outside of you just listening to this show. And if that's something that you're interested in, the best way to do that is to go to my website and to make sure that you're on the free email list. And in order to do that, you would go to jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I think that's fine. I will touch base with you on the other side like I usually do, but let's go ahead and get to it. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Ryan Cunningham. Hello. Hey, Ryan. <laughs> How are you? I'm well. <laughs> it's good to hear your voice and your laugh. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and I think you know the deal. I'm already recording. If it's okay, I want us to consider us having just begun. That's okay. Totally. Uh, that I I would expect nothing less. And I just finished listening to the um to the uh, episode you put out today. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. That's the... perfect. <laughs> well, it really did converge with my email exchange with you. And I would just say for anybody who's listening to this at some other point in time, that if there was one person I want to speak to right now about the topic that I was talking about on the podcast this week, it would be you. <laughs> because we have such a long history of a conversation around this. Yes, and, and it's the conversation I, I have in my head and on whiteboards and, and <laughs> on spreadsheets, <laughs> mostly just to myself <laughs> right. all the time. It's like, how do we, how, how does, how, what does the future of, of this whole thing actually look like? <laughs> Well, let me lay out the long history because you are in a small, very select group of people who has had now a fourth appearance on the show. And it's because oh, wow. your it's because your first appearance goes so far back. You were the fourth episode that I ever had of this show. It was November 2015, and I had slept on your couch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you, <right>. were, <laughs> you were working at Back Bay, I believe it was called, right? Yes. Yeah. And you, just so you know, you were sandwiched between episode three, which was Richard Carpell, the then CEO of Yoga Lions. <laughs> and on the other side of you was Elena Brower, no less. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? That goes How so far that? back. So far back. I almost don't want to mention it because I'm a little like it's hard for me to listen because I was so green at that time. <laughs> but the conversation that we were having, some was because like the week before I had got there, Back Bay had been sold to Yoga Works. Indeed, yes. And that was a very significant moment, 2015, where Yoga Works was coming in and buying all of these independent yoga centers. For reasons that still confound me, but... Uh, <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> well, it was interesting because at that moment, we, we were both trying to be very hopeful about it, I think. 
because yeah, it was I, a struggle. So. It was a, it was a struggle for centers, you know? Yeah, in for general. sure. For sure. Even at that time, even in November of 2015. So fast forward another year, just one year, it's December, 2016. And I come visit you at your yoga center, Bow Street. You have your own yoga center. Yes. We recorded an episode with Kate at that time. And how long did you have Bow Street? Uh, all told, it was four years. So January of 2016, um, I, I took it over from a friend um, uh, who had run it for four years before that. And then we closed like last week of December, 2019, not having any idea what was about to unfold <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> in 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it took me, uh, it took me a very long time to acknowledge that, that, that space on Bow Street, uh, was, was a success in every way other than financial. (laughs) It was exactly the type of studio that I wanted to run. It was exactly the type of community that I wanted to have the studio in. It just, it just couldn't, it certainly couldn't support me (laughs) as a, as a human living in Mm -hmm. Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it had very limited potential to grow because it was just a one room. It was just a one room space. So when you have just a one room space, you can only really do one thing at a time. And, Mm -hmm. uh, it just, it makes it a, a hard to, uh, um, keep going. And, and at that time, uh, the public transit that had been promised to that neighborhood, um, had not, had not happened yet. It's now open. So there's, there's now a train that comes into that, that neighborhood, which would have definitely helped the studio. Mm. <laughs> thrive. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. But it had already, the promise of, of public transport to that neighborhood had already begun to hike my rent, um, pretty mm-hmm. significantly. Uh, and, uh, it still sits there empty though. Um, <laughs> See, well, listen, let's put a pin in there because I want to talk about that space and the leases and the fact that yeah. it's still sitting there empty. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's very significant, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. But we should also mention that you did have one other appearance that was in April of 2020, which was a very weird time, as you were saying. Yes, a very strange time. But we did touch base on a bunch of things there, but one of the things we talked about was that you had let go of the studio. You had gone back and gotten yourself licensed as a massage therapist, and we're, we were basically both like the yoga center models done, you know? Yes. I recall. <laughs> we were both pretty convinced <laughs> on a lot of levels that it was done. Yeah. But here yeah. we are now. It's, you know, more than three, th- three or three and a half years later. And, you know, the world fell apart in the meantime. Yep. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that happened is, you know, I was, I put out that episode this week that it was just me kind of ranting about what it would be like to open a yoga center nowadays. And then that coincided with those emails that I got, which seemed to me was like all of the spaces that were yoga centers in Boston are kind of getting shuffled almost. Yes, they're very much getting shuffled. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, isn't that interesting, you know? And so in any case, I really appreciate that you answered my email and that you gave me some time I, I, and that you took some time out of your summer to record and talk with me. Thanks. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Of course. Of course. It's a, a lovely thing to do on a Monday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let me first... I guess, touch base with you and what's been going on with you. Because last I had heard, like I said, you had let go of the studio, you had gone back. And I know everything, whatever fell apart with the pandemic. But at that time, you were really focused on just doing like uh, body work, manual therapy, if I'm not mistaken, or like one-to-one mentorships. 
And then like, yeah. maybe but then I noticed when I went to your website, getting ready to talk to you that you seem to be teaching at a bunch of different centers. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so as, as you, uh, you know, you could probably guess, uh, the, uh, during over the pandemic, the, the number of folks who were wanting to have uh, one-on-one in-person uh, interaction uh, was fairly small. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did, uh, you know, I did start to teach at other centers and, um, and, you know, really my, my plan had been, you know, I, I had a part-time job, um, managing and directing a small Dharma center, uh, which ended up kind of falling apart in the way that centers fall apart. Just just like just yoga centers, to, the Dharma centers yeah, do the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Dharma centers, the same thing happens. <laughs> um, especially when it's a Dharma center without like endowment, you know, when it's, when it's yeah. a new, you know, um, a new type of center. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, this past year in 2023, I, I had started to teach at centers again, and I've kind of come <laughs> interestingly full circle uh, and actually get the keys to a small office space uh, on Friday mm-hmm. um, to start seeing um, to start seeing folks individually, but also with the hope of having some like, small group slash hybrid um, programming in there because. Uh, it really, you know, there are the, the studio owners that I, that I've chosen to work for over the past, you know, six months as I've tried to go back out there in the, in the world and teach, um, mm. are really lovely people. I enjoy working for them. I enjoy their studios, but it's, it's really hard, um, for me anyway, I won't speak for anyone else for me to teach what I'm passionate about teaching in someone else's context. Mm. Um, and when the context, uh, not through any fault of studio owners, just the nature of the business is this kind of like, um, it's become this like very service based model. People come in, they, they are paying, you know, whether they would identify it or not as such a, a kind of workout class, it holds the same kind of it, for many people, it holds the same kind of frame, not for everybody, but it holds the same, same kind of idea. And I just don't really fit in. And I also really love teaching small classes. And if I'm teaching at studios, I just can't make, I can't make enough money mm-hmm. teaching small classes. You know, I get the same group of like four or five people and I'm like, Oh, this is great. I really get to know these people. I really get to share practice with them, but because everything is done on a per head basis, it's like, okay, if I want to teach small groups of people, the only way that makes sense from a financial standpoint is to go out on my own and do it. And I should say that by my own, uh, there's a group of three of us that, um, you know, are basically doing a kind of collective model where we share the expenses of having, um, you know, the facilities, uh, mainly the online facilities and, and technology to do the classes. Um, and then we distribute the expenses accordingly based on who's using various pieces of, of, uh, technology and whatnot. And, uh, and then just everyone gets paid out of a similar bank account at the end of, end of the month. So mm-hmm. that's been working really well. I, I think as you talked about on the, on the, uh, podcast this morning that very much requires a group of people that have like a common <laughs> conception yeah, so. of practice and uh, trust. <laughs> I, I would have said a high degree of <laughs> communication and collaboration is needed. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, that is so interesting to me that you six months ago were like, let me get back out there. Cause I, I've been having the same impulse, but I did that when I first came to Pennsylvania, like when I first got here after I let go of the center, I, 
started teaching at a bunch of centers. And I had a similar experience, it seems like, that you had, which is the same thing. Like I had my center, then you had your center, and then I tried to go back to the other centers, and then you did too. (laughs) But it seemed like it was sort of what you said, that if what you were teaching was trying to get out of the frame of yes, the same like you know, on their, on their calendar, on their phones, they get the same color coding as going to the gym was going to yoga class, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And to try to get out of the frame of that and have it be something else was the big challenge always. And you could find situations, like you said, you'd have like your four or five who became the people who liked your class. Yeah. But it would sometimes create a lot of tension because you ideally would be getting more people than that. Yes. <laughs> For everybody, because it is interesting, like you said, and I was talking about that, the per student rate, which is how we're always doing it. So can you share what it is? Like, I'm curious, is it the same rate as it was back in 2000? More or less, it is the same rate that I got paid. Um, And of course, the cost of living in Boston has gone up immensely. Threefold, yeah. And, you know, this isn't like, I I always have to be really careful because I don't want it to sound like this is the, like, fault of most studio owners because also the average price per square foot on a space has gone through the roof. Um, I think, I think it's depending on, uh, you know, depending on what you look at in Boston metro area, it's like 40 to $60 a square foot is the average. Mm -hmm. Um, which makes it, I think when we closed back bay or when, when yoga works took over back bay, I think it was hovering. Our rent was somewhere around like $27 uh, a square foot. So that like gives you a (laughs) a second, $27 a square foot. That was a big studio. Yes. Yeah. That was like two studios. That was two rooms, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, so now wait a second. Let's a go. Let, let's let's <laughs> stay there for just a second because when you were managing Back Bay back in 2015, where you when you were so kindly arranged for me to come teach a workshop there, right before it got sold to Yoga yes. Works, <laughs> the rent was that high. You, were you seeing the books? Was it? Was it in the red? Was it making enough money to pay the rent and all the teachers? It was actually. Um, I I think it was, I think it was in a very, um, unique, right place, right time. That location, um, which is uh, a location that is being reopened, uh, next week, um, in September. Yes, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a second. Yes. (laughs) Uh, is, uh, a fairly, you know, central location in, in downtown Boston. Um, and it also existed at a time where there wasn't, there there weren't a ton of yoga studios in, in Boston, particularly in that neighborhood of, of Boston. Like if you work down there, it was, it was very, very convenient to get to. Um, and I think we were able to between, you know, th- this got tougher towards the end of the, the end of it, but between teacher training and like inviting the big traveling teachers in, mm-hmm. um, we were really able to make it work. Now, I think where the, for me, any, anyway, where towards the end, it got a little difficult is we found ourselves more having to invite big name teachers that we knew would sell out as opposed to the people that we actually wanted to bring selfishly mm-hmm. so that we could, <laughs> I mean, that's how the traveling teacher thing started, at least for, you know, for Lynn and myself was like, let's bring the teachers that we can't afford to take the time off to go study with wherever they live. <laughs> so well, that we could... <laughs> you know, I, I made a reference to exactly what you're talking about in my little rant this week, because I do recall like, I was never one who packed the house necessarily, <laughs> but, but I, I did okay my first visit to a place often. And, yes. you know, it was always interesting to me, like, there just seemed to me after doing it for a year or two to be a bit of a tension in what yeah. you're saying that the centers were having these big teachers come in 
And they were often like good money makers for both the center and like the visiting teacher, but it would kind of steal the fire of like the local scene in a way. So it become harder for like local teachers to do their workshops and have people come to them, you know? Yeah. Or, or it would just sort of, I mean, even in a very direct way, like it could decimate a person who teaches on Saturday and that's their biggest class of the week. And if they're paid by head, yes, you know, like it, <laughs> and everyone's day, in the nobody workshop. Nobody shows up to class. <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> like that, yeah. that would, that, that was always a bit of a like, <laughs> yeah. um, and you know, uh, I, I think for, for certain teachers, they would just opt to be like, I'm not going to teach class today. Like so-and-so's in town. Everyone's going <laughs> there. Like, let's just push everybody to go to the workshop instead. But, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think there is that tension. And I think the other thing that I've noticed too is as, uh, especially with the advent of, of more online teaching being available, it's like, it feels like that traveling circuit has kind of died down and it feels like it had been dying down for a, for a long time. Um, it was moving and, to like Asia or other places. Yes, or exactly. Like, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and I think, you know, once it's, it's really lovely. Like, uh, I mean, I think of Judith Lasseter all the time. Like I was lucky enough to get to take those, the trainings that she does like multiple times over the course of my, career and you know you get enough people who are interested in that work and then local teachers begin to want to offer that work and offer trainings and and perspectives of their own on it and then while it's really great to have someone like that come to town every once in a while it certainly doesn't become you know feasible or even economical to necessarily bring them in every single year Mm -hmm. um like we used to do in you know 2012 um you just bring the same guest teacher (laughs) yeah you had like (laughs) Like rotation of of guest teachers in every every year and they were doing well people were coming yeah people were doing they were doing really well and (laughs) and i do wonder though like i i Oh, I think we've maybe talked about this, but in a, in a previous life, <laughs> I was a musician. Um, right. That's what got me into yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a teacher in New York that I would go see, particularly because he was just known as someone who could help folks who were, who were having like physical difficulties playing their instrument. Like I had pretty severe pain when playing for a while when I was younger. Um, and he's a fantastic woodwind player, probably still around, this guy named Andrew Sturman. And I remember going to his house for a lesson in New York. I had just like taken the train down from Boston and we started talking about yoga and, and he was like, you know, eventually this whole thing, this whole yoga thing is going to go back underground again. Hmm. And that was like in probably in like, 2009 <laughs> and like just given the trajectory that i was seeing i was like ah, <laughs> it was still true. on the uprise at that <laughs> moment but he saw the writing on the wall early didn't he yeah yeah he definitely did <laughs> wow. Wow, wow um and it does feel like that I, it feels like yeah at least to me anyway the like and I've said this forever, like there is a real limit to the scale of this before you lose the potential. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Let me ask you a question. Was there a time when you were at back Bay where it was paying its rent and doing okay without TT and the big teacher events? Um, yes, actually there was not, really ever a time well let me put it let me put it this way like we, there was a time when we expanded and and took on another floor in that building oh, so and you there were started definitely out with one floor and then moved to two how long after did how long had it been one one floor before it became two do you know um i mean in my tenure there that that was a part of the reason why i became a bigger part of the management team was to to help with expanding in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And, you know, there were definitely questions being had about like, okay, we've got this big, massive room that can fit a hundred people, but we can't fit a hundred people at 10 a.m. Like a hundred people aren't coming in the middle of the day, right? <laughs> That's just not going to happen. Um, so, but I never remember a time where there was ever any kind of like dire conversation. It was always chugged along and, um, you know, those of us that were doing the teacher training, it's not like most studios do nowadays where it's a like per hour fee or something to be part of the teacher training. Like we were all getting a profit share. So it's not like at the end of the day, the studio would end up taking all that much money mm -hmm. from the teacher trainings. Mm -hmm. So it, it had done, I mean, it did well enough for yoga works to buy them. Right. So like, <laughs> well, they also had that space and a lease and a student yeah. base. Yeah, exactly. So and I guess, do you think that you had a personal relationship to the woman who yeah, opened and started that place? Right. Yeah. And that, is it because she was a teacher and she ran it in a certain way that that was the case, that it was a profit share on the yoga teacher training? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's why I stopped working for Yoga Works because I just remember what they offered me compared to what I had been getting for teacher trainings was so, so mm. like minuscule. Um, mm. uh, but I think it was, that was also more the norm. Yes. Back then. Like that just, I, I think it was just, well, how else would we do it? We just do a pro pro profit share. <laughs> like, so, so let me ask you this then like the floor that they had originally before they took on the other floor mm -hmm. that had just one room or two rooms in it. Two rooms. That was the, that front yellow room was, was that original. That how that big were those? Floor. How many people could you put in those rooms? Well, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, there was like the mat to mat version and then there was like the actual people feeling comfortable version. Yeah. So I know. My, I remember like, I didn't want that. The, I didn't want the front room. Um, the smaller of the two, well, there were three, three rooms. So the smallest of the three rooms, I, I sort of drew the line at like 28 people, mm -hmm. um, in there, the back room, I feel like it, there was a time where we almost would cram like 70 in there, but I think 60, I think like 50 is comfortable in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the, 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 the big, big room we had, you know, you, you you could fit quite a few. We some of those workshops had like 80, 80 90 people in them. Um, that, to me, that's crazy. If you have a space that has one room that can put sixty people and one room that can put like twenty five people comfortably, why would you need another floor? What was well, the was reasoning just, behind growing? It was really. Bigger? It was really booming and those you know when you've got a even with a room that fits 65 when you got a you were uh, selling out a room of 65 yeah it was it was but there were fewer studios it was a different time i think the trend that i see with a lot of new spaces that are getting built out is they for better or for worse have have rooms that are a little bit smaller Mm. which also inadvertently caps the amount that they pay their teachers. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is true. <laughs> Whether this they are true. aware that that's what they're doing, that's what they're doing. Well, but <laughs> I, again, I think it's also, like you said, square footage. Exactly. So do you, do you think that, I don't know how to say, like, I'm, I'm assuming that the lease that, I'm forgetting her name had on the space, the original back base space. I I wrote down the address, the 364, 364 plus, uh, Boylston street address, right? Yes. Did at that address, did she start out with good rent and then it just keeps going up each year? Like happened with me in Brooklyn. It was, it was, a. Uh, I don't remember the, details but i think it was it was a pretty standard you know just at every time we exercised an option the rent would to go extend up, yeah. the the rent would go up um yeah. uh, but they were they were long you know they were i think if memory serves that they were definitely at least five year yeah um at the very at least five year leases um but you know those those that locking in the rent for a period of time can be really nice but then the 
the um, <laughs> the uh, inevitable hike at the, the end renewal is the, the killer. Is, yes, is the killer. You know yes. the the the. I hesitate to say lease at Bow Street. The handshake, <laughs> yes, <laughs> at Bow Street. But was... that's what I'm saying. It at that time. <laughs> I, I was saying it this week that I think that some of the people, <laughs> like the woman who opened Back Bay, they had like a landlord they could talk to. You know, they had yeah. like a huge. He was. They were landlords, but you could also. They were humans, and the spaces yes. weren't being used for anything, and they were. Good tenants. Yoga centers were good tenants a lot of times. Yep. yep. You know, they didn't. And, yeah, go and ahead. It, and there's also from a, you know, if a, if a space is built out for a yoga studio, I think landlords also have to think about like, okay, well, there's a very limited number of other businesses that are going to want to move in to this place. Exactly. So as it we is, might yeah, as well. Know. Yeah. Like uh, we might as well just like keep something similar in, but I know that, you know, I've talked to the landlord at, at Bow street. Um, cause he owns a couple of, of other things and, and, uh, properties in the same neighborhood. And so I, I run into him from time to time and he was just like, you know, it's better for me to just to have that space for my kids to run around in. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. You know, it's funny. I, I I had a very good relationship with my landlord in Brooklyn. Like we were on cell phone texting, you know, level together at a certain point after 10 years of living, being right under him. He lived upstairs. Yeah. And, you know, at some point after I left, like, I don't know how, a couple years after I left, he actually texted me and he was like, hey, you want the space back? <laughs> you know, he was like ready to give me a really good price on it. Cause I just think he, <clears throat> he, he liked having the yoga center there, but yeah. it, 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 even at the time when I left, you know, he did me a solid and helped like me give the lease over to someone else. And he, he was giving me slightly under market rate, but it was still too much. You know, it was yeah. like at a certain point it tipped over an edge where the, the market for the real estate and the rent and the overhead for the center was just, was just too much. You know, you can only raise yeah. the price of a yoga class so much. You can only have so many yoga classes, right? Your room well, is only so uh, big, like you said. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's fundamentally the issue is the, the, the cost of everything, real estate, you know, uh, the expectations of what a yoga studio is should be for better or for worse is a lot higher than like, let's just like slap on a coat of paint and <laughs> it's a hardwood floor. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, Which is basically uh, the deal. Back then. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter if like you, you know, the floor is slanted at like a, you know, <laughs> five degree. <laughs> right? You know, you just figure out where the best place in the room is to handstand. So you don't have to fight gravity. Uh, <laughs> uh, like everything has gone up, including the price of the cost of living for teachers. And I think the, um, if anyone ever starts to do the math on like what, and, and, and I, I kind of, do this all the time, you know, even with a very conservative estimate on what the cost of living is in Boston, if a teacher, you know, wants to teach 12 classes a week and have a full-time gig, they, they're going to need to clear like probably close to 150 a class mm -hmm. just to, just to make ends meet. Like, no, yeah, possible. Okay. how are you going to, what, who, yeah. I don't know anybody who's going to get, unless they're privates and there's something like yeah, that. Yeah. Well, exactly. Like if, but, but if, if the standard of pay is always this like $25 um, or whatever. Yeah. $28 plus three or $30 plus three or 45 plus X. Is that the new X base or, rate? 28 and then three ahead? Yep. Is that the new <laughs> kind of um, Interesting. And it just, it, the economics don't, they just don't work out. And so what it leaves you with is a lot of people who can dedicate time to teaching yoga are also people who then have significant financial help. Yeah. yeah. Um, other other I have, resources. Yeah, yeah. I have significant financial help from a part-time job that I have, <laughs> which is going to allow me to 
to try this new thing in my in in an office space in Cambridge. Uh, you know, some people have trust funds, some people have spouses, some people have like familial wealth. It, 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 however, you parse it, like you just get a group of people who have the means and myself included to actually spend time practicing and teaching yoga. And I don't, I think that's, that's not going to lead us to a sustainable, I don't think that's going to lead us anywhere other than where we've been. And we know that where we've been doesn't necessarily work out. (laughs) We don't need a repeat of that again. Yes. No, 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 no. We don't need a repeat of that. Um, Well, I guess, let me ask you about your recent experience of being back in the centers. Uh, I know you said earlier that you feel like the context is is a challenge. And I know that I think in the past I made exceptions just because sometimes it's really nice to have a place to go to where there's like nice people and you can meet people, new people come in potentially from the center or whatever, that there's like, totally, there's a good, there's a value to that. And in that experience, I'm also curious about if there are other classes at the center that are doing really well and like packed or whatever. Yeah. I I mean, I think, I think at least at the centers that I teach at, which is, you know, has been um, three different centers right now. Yeah. So, so I had been teaching at JP center, um, uh, which is uh, a neighborhood studio south of uh, it's in in Boston, but in the Jamaica Plain um, neighborhood, and then over in Charlestown at Asana, Charlestown, and then at uh, what is now Back Bay Yoga Union, which is the moving into the 364 Boylston Street space. Yes. And there are all there's a wide variety of classes that that are doing well. Like I can't say like you know there used to be the narrative like oh it's only like the vinyasa classes that can can succeed i think for me the the difficulty arises just from what what my current practice is which is way more focused on on meditation and then the asana is just a sort of outgrowth of of what i am doing and what i'm practicing in my um, meditation practice. And that's, uh, is very much the opposite of this. Like, let's just do (laughs) like, you know, you do asana, the, the old narrative of like, you do asana long enough. And then at some point, some you'll, you'll feel quote unquote ready to do meditation. Like, uh, Mm -hmm. that's, that's not really my experience. It's the, the meditative practice is what allows me to do asana in a way that's therapeutic and, and, and helpful to my existence. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask you about your meditation classes in a bit. I want to get to that. Something I want to talk to you about, because I yeah. saw that that's been your focus. I guess my curiosity around the classes is that it seems like um, the people who are coming to the yoga centers these days, it, it, it aren't coming for the more contemplative kinds of classes as much as we were sort of saying before, and I guess that was happening even before everything fell apart. Maybe it's the same as it ever was, or is it even worse? Because I just, I tend to lean, maybe this is like wildly optimistic, but I just think it's the same as it always was. (laughs) (laughs) And, and I think, and I think part of this, and, and I, I, maybe I've even said this on the podcast is like, whoever is in charge, particularly, you know, in, in the case of all of these studios that I teach at, it's always, they're, they're all sole proprietor. Like they're, they're owned by a single person. Mm -hmm. Um, the studio will always take on the personality of the, of the person at the, of the person in charge. Like it will always have the feeling of that person. Bow street felt like Teresa when Teresa was running it and felt like me when, when I was running it. And even if you had different teachers in front of the room, there was still an element like, like the person in charge guides the ship and they're at the end of the day, legally and financially. And I would argue from a practice perspective, responsible from, for what goes on in the context of the, of the studio. And I, 
miss being able to not so much guide the financial part of it, mm. <laughs> but guide the the practice part of it and set the and, tone, set the tone. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's, you know, there's setting the tone in what you do at the front of the classroom. But uh, just like you, I lived right behind where Bow Street was and I would go down there every morning that I could and practice for a good long period of time. And, and the more practice takes place in a, in a space, it, it is to me palpable when you step in, um, that, that, that for me is, is, is very felt. Um, and you know, I, I want to be able to set, set the tone in a more meaningful way. And, and, you know, that's what Fez and myself and Nicolina have been trying to do online um and now i'm just going to see if what's possible in the space and if it doesn't work in the space and i just see uh people for manual therapy in in the space that's fine too but i mm-hmm. i think it will be enough to fit five or six people in there in person and then be able to have people stream in um yep yep yep, yep. i i really i really mm-hmm. like what you said and i think you're totally right on about setting the tone that there is a tone that gets set from the top and whether that's like a single person or like a management team even or like a corporate master yes (laughs) (laughs) there's a tone that comes down and i do recently i had an experience that it's making me think about what you said where I had, I mentioned it in my little rant this week. I put out a sign and like some people I didn't know just showed up to class. Oh, and yeah. I've been yeah. teaching all these classes with people who, like you, I think some more have been coming online because they are familiar with me and what I'm doing and they're interested in that. And so to have like some random people just drop in was super fun, but it was one of those situations that I haven't faced in a really long time yes. where <laughs> I haven't. I haven't been demonstrating stuff. Like I don't demonstrate that much stuff anymore. And like, they were just like blankly staring and not doing anything. If I wasn't demonstrating, you know, where people have that expectation that the teacher is going to be doing everything for them to follow along with. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, right. (laughs) I forgot about that whole thing, you know? And so, yep. yep. I mean, and just like, I can't even, Physically, it's not good. You know, if what you're doing is about people listening to what their own stuff, you know, like you don't want to impose it on them necessarily like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want them to try to make it look like me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, but, but that's, you know, that, that is, uh, even I think more of a norm, um, mm-hmm. than, uh, than it had been before. And, um, and, you know, I, I also acknowledge that like some people are never going to learn without some sort of like visual. And, and you know what, feedback. especially when someone's new to practice, I'm actually, yeah. it's nice for them to just have someone to follow along with. And I don't know that that's bad necessarily too. I don't yes. want to say yeah. that's always bad, but you know, that the idea that the focus is really on like how to do the poses right or whatever. Yes. Is, is the yes. thing that you and I, for as many years as we've known each other, have been talking about trying to find ways to move away from, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and that, that's, and I think what's tricky is like, it, it is helpful to have some loose standard to like define the parameters of the exploration. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Yes, they can be loosened too far and then we don't know what we're yes. doing anymore, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> like at some point someone needs to learn a C major scale. Like as like this at some point Fair it's enough. it's gotta happen to be able to like have a have a conversation. Um but then pretty quickly, uh, uh, I think much quicker than than has been the norm in in people's kind of pedagogical models, it 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 really needs to become about choice. Like what are you trying to feel like why like why are we doing this pose what can you feel in this pose um have you tried feeling this have you tried feeling that like it it has to become much more of an inquiry um otherwise i think i think i would have probably left asana completely behind 
Yes. Um, like I, yes. <laughs> it certainly w- if it was just for like the physical strength and flexibility, it fails. Yes, it way. absolutely. <laughs> I'd much rather go like ride a bike or lift heavy things if it was just yeah. going to be about the- <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. just about the strength and flexibility component. <laughs> well, all right. You mentioned like you just are getting this new space. You've been teaching at these other places, but I'm kind of curious if you, have you been out there looking around at spaces? I mentioned that I have sort of been fantasizing for the first time ever. <laughs> like I said, last time we spoke in 2020, we were like, fuck yoga centers. They're done. You know, we were like, not, not thinking we wanted to have any spaces necessarily, but I guess I'm curious those other spaces. So the original space, the back base space was the 364 Boylston street space. And that's the one that had the two floors, like we were talking about, right? Yes. Yes. But then there's this other space, which is one, 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 two Boylston street. And that's when, what is it? Boston yoga union. When did they open up? Uh, before the pandemic, um, that actually to complicate things even more, um, <laughs> that was the, uh, one, one, uh, two, one, 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 two, 11, 12 Boylston street, um, was the very first space that back Bay yoga opened oh, in. So back Bay was there originally before it was at 364. Yes. And then oh moved my to God. 364. And then, uh, Tim and Emily, uh, opened Boston yoga union before the pandemic. I forget the exact year. And, uh, and, um, I don't, I can't really say all that much, although I'm sure Tim will be sort of making some, some, um, uh, rounds. I'll be happy to talk to him. Yeah. 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 Um, but basically, uh, Tim is, is moving, um, the studio, uh, and I think Emily is, is kind of stepping back from an ownership role over to, um, uh, 364 Boylston street, just literally like I was there painting baseboards the other day. <laughs> wow. Out. Like um, old times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, it was so it, incestuous though. With the incestuousness of the spaces is what I'm thinking yes, about. Yes. Right. Um, like they, so the original space gets, they, you grow out of that. How big is the 11, 12 Boylston street? It, it's pretty big. It's pretty big. Um, uh, it's, that's three rooms, but three smaller rooms, you know, it was probably a room that could maybe fit like eight mats in a room that can fit. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I think some people would disagree with me, but I would say like max 20 (laughs) (laughs) and, and, uh, another room that could, uh, can probably fit more in the like 60 range. See, isn't that interesting though about scale? We were talking about scales yeah. and the sizes of rooms, but yeah. it's still within the range. It's still so much. I had one room that was like twelve hundred square feet. You know? Yes, that was yeah. Bow Street was was a similar a similar size to the to the studio in Brooklyn. Yeah, and that included uh, space for the entry. You know? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but wow. I I don't know. I think. There need to be more, there need to be more spaces, um, for people to practice in. Like, I, I love teaching online. I think it's great. Um, I think Boston particularly benefits from having more people, uh, with studios if they can make it work. <laughs> um, because otherwise it's just, you know, it, it's, it just becomes like one big regional yoga chain. And I actually don't think that that helps helps anybody. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's, it's interesting. Cause we should just, I mean, we should mention it because the, you know, now that this, the Boston yoga union started out in the, what in the original space and then moved to 364. Is that the deal? Yes. Yeah. And then now they're moving back to that space or I'm sorry. I'm no, confused. No, it's like, yeah. I'm, I'm confused. It's, it's very confusing. So so they're moving to 364 following the same path that Back Bay uh, yoga so did. They started out at 11, 12 uh, like Back Bay, and now uh, they're uh, moving uh, to uh, the slightly bigger version at uh, 364. It's a, it actually will will be the the fourth floor. The other floor that we had had uh, was taken over by another business, so they're just moving uh, to that original single original. floor. Um, and you say that's a better location too than the other one. You think? I think so. I I um. 
you know, 11, 12 was, uh, for me was great. Cause it, that's where I was doing body work out of. Um, and, uh, it was right next to Berkeley college of music where I also, um, teach. So I was able to like, it just kind of, it, it was, it was convenient, but in terms of like just general Boston geography, 364 Boylston street was is definitely an easier place for most people to get to. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, and, I mean, maybe you don't know. Maybe I should yeah. wait to talk to, I think you said Tim, if he wants to come on. But I guess I'm kind of curious about those leases because I also... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.